Ready to go. All right. Hi, my name is Eric Larson. I'm an attorney here in Cincinnati. I'm going to talk today on this video about bankruptcy basics. Um, I say that with all the potential lawyerly disclaimers. Um, this is basics, <laughs> so take that for what it's worth. But my hope with this presentation is to walk you through what the bankruptcy process would be um, if it were something that you chose to pursue in your life. Um, again, I'm Eric Larson. I'm a founding member of a small law firm here in town called Larson & Lucas. Uh, in addition to uh, litigation, my partner and I do uh, consumer protection and bankruptcy. Um, so you know, I've been practicing, good grief, what is it now, 12 years. Um, learned the, uh, the bankruptcy law practice first in law school from uh, Judge Hopkins, who is now the senior bankruptcy judge for the Southern District of Ohio. Um, in fact, when in doubt, I ask myself what he asks, what he says to me in court when I'm in front of him, which is dreadful, because <laughs> his, his, his statement his, in the form of a question is always, Mr. Larson, you know what's expected of you here, right? <laughs> so we do, our, we do our best to provide Judge Hopkins with what he wants and uh, to uh, put everything up front. That's also something I confirmed when I was learning the practice um, at, a, at another law firm here in town. Big surprise, I'm not the only bankruptcy attorney in town. Um, if you're looking for one, I think my very first piece of advice is make sure that you, you meet with at least a handful of different people so that you find someone that you're comfortable with because you're gonna be talking about things that are oftentimes difficult for you to talk about or, or difficult to, to even think about and bring up because it, it, this is a hard process. Nobody wants to come and see me for bankruptcy, and that's okay. We're, we're gonna get you through it. First off, one thing I like to tell people, bankruptcy is in the Constitution. Of every right and responsibility and things that we hear in the news and argue about socially, oftentimes those words don't appear in the Constitution. Uh, bankruptcy does. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4 authorizes Congress to enact uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. What does that mean? Two things. One, it's a federal case. Your bankruptcy is a federal case to be heard in the Southern District of Ohio. Here in Cincinnati, um, it is centered down on uh, 4th Street. And um, yes, it, it's, it's, that's where the federal court is. Um, there's also federal bankruptcy courts in Columbus and in Dayton, but we're gonna focus on what usually occurs here in Cincinnati and if you, you fall into that. The other part of what that means is that way back in history when they were drafting our Constitution, the Founding Fathers acknowledged the fact that in a system that they were building, sometimes people would fall behind. Sometimes situations would arise where it became unavoidable for debt to overwhelm somebody. And in their wisdom, they reasoned that people should be allowed to get a fresh start, to be able to put that behind them, not without cost. Obviously, a, a fresh start doesn't mean start from where you were, it means start over. But to, to free themselves from that burden so that they can move forward, not just for the benefit of that person, but for the benefit of society in general. A lot of people are very uncomfortable when they come to me. They're embarrassed, sometimes they're ashamed. These are things that I, I want to encourage you to, to let go of if, it, if bankruptcy is something you're considering and looking at because it's, it's just not, not healthy, <laughs> to, to be honest. I had a, a wonderful friend. Um, I, I did not do her bankruptcy, although a, a person who I worked with did. I, I felt it would be inappropriate for me to do it. Um, and, and they had flown high for a long time, been very successful, and um, had a business fail. And it put them in a situation where they had to leave their home, uh, move into an apartment, and, and change things. But the way she described it to me was that once the ball was really rolling, it was like this giant weight was lifted from their shoulders, and they were able to move forward. And now they're 
they're back. <laughs> they've, they've managed to, to pull everything together. So no one says it's going to be easy, but it's not something for that, that I don't think anybody wants you to feel ashamed or, or embarrassed about. It's something that happens. Now, the three main reasons, the big three, job loss, that's kind of a, an obvious one. Illness, medical bills add up fast, and, and sometimes insurance doesn't cover things, or sometimes insurance isn't there, and that, that can really hurt you. And surprisingly, divorce. Um, divorce has its own little little sub, sub note to it that we'll get to in a little while. But those are the, the three biggies. Uh, now, if you don't have one of those three, that's okay. That's okay, different things happen. But those are the three main reasons. And oftentimes those are all reasons for things that you never wanted to happen, you didn't plan to happen, you didn't want to happen in your life. So, so don't, don't be taking all of that to heart. That said, chances are, if you have thought about bankruptcy, you should probably talk to a lawyer. They might tell you, no, it's not right for you or they may walk you through it and then you can decide it's not right for you. Uh, by speaking to a lawyer, it's not a commitment. Um, nine, I would say 90% of lawyers here in Cincinnati, the initial consultation is without cost. Uh, two reasons. One, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to do this. And, and two, we're talking about bankruptcy. So you, you, there, there may not be a lot of money to put up, up front. And we don't want to, to harm anybody with that. Um, so, so don't hesitate to reach out. That's, that's, why these, that's why these law practices exist. All right, some vocabulary. Things to think about. Debtor, that's you. So if I say debtor, you're the person who owes a debt. Creditor, that's who you owe money to. Um, a secured debt is a debt that is attached to property. The most common types of secured debt are a car loan and your mortgage. A car loan is, a, a secured debt is something that's attached to the property, meaning if you default on your car loan, your car can be taken from you and sold. And then that money put towards paying off your debt, even though you don't have that car anymore. Unsecured debt is a more simple debt, a credit card, a medical bill, uh, a loan that isn't attached to anything, anything like that. The goal in bankruptcy is to get you to discharge. The debts are discharged. Secured debts are dis or unsecured debts are what gets discharged a hundred percent. Secured debts, you're keeping the car. If you're keeping the car, you, you still have to pay for it. But there are different things that happen in bankruptcy that you need a lawyer to talk to about to try and figure out how to make that work right. The trustee. Trustee is something that is someone that reviews your case. They are appointed by the Department of Justice to stand in the shoes of all your creditors and consider what you've presented to make sure that, that your bankruptcy is acceptable under the law. And then the estate, defined broadly, that's your stuff. It's a legal fiction that's created when you file a bankruptcy that all of your stuff is now controlled by the court. And, um, and if there's something that you own that isn't protected, they could take it and sell it. And that's, that's what that estate exists. On the opposite side of that coin, and I don't have it on the screen, but the other part of what you want when you file a bankruptcy is called a stay. And the stay is the equivalent of a federal court order. A federal court order telling everybody you owe money to, that credit card that's calling you, that, uh, that, that car lot that, that is, is, is looking to tow your car away, that that they can't do that. <laughs> they're not allowed to do that, and if they do that, they're violating the law, and they face penalties and consequences as a result of violating that. Okay, uh, one of the very first things you'll be told about is that there are multiple chapters of bankruptcy. In fact, we are required under the law to make sure you understand um, what you're looking at and what you're considering. There's chapter nine, there's chapter seven, there's chapter 11, there's chapter 12. Mainly what we're gonna look at is chapter seven and chapter 13. Chapter seven and 13 are primarily consumer bankruptcies. That, that's you, that's the, a, a personal bankruptcy. Um, it is so required under the law that in fact you will be asked under oath at some point, did your attorney explain to you the difference between chapter seven and chapter 13? So in my process, I know I, I do it at least three times, <laughs> um, but here I'm gonna do it now. Um, chapter seven, it's what most people think of when they think of bankruptcy. Um, it is a liquidation bankruptcy. What that means is that you, if you have an asset, something that you own, some piece of your stuff, that isn't somehow protected, it can be taken from you and sold. 
and that the proceeds from that sale, the money from that sale, is then divided up amongst your creditors so that they get a little something. In exchange, you get that clean slate. Or it's, sometimes it's a no asset bankruptcy. Now that doesn't mean you don't own anything. That means that there's no assets for the bankruptcy trustee to administer. There's nothing for the bankruptcy trustee to sell. So exhale, we're gonna get to this in a moment. You, it's unlikely you're going to lose your Honda. It's unlikely you're going to lose your house. It's unlikely unless there's reasons beyond that. Now, if you have a uh, convertible sports car, yeah, that, that, might be <laughs> that might be on the block, but you're not gonna be without a vehicle. You're not going to lose the family minivan. Those things we protect and the law protects. Chapter 13 is different than chapter seven. It's a personal reorganization. It, you make a monthly payment to the trustee over a three to five year period. Basically in describing chapter 13, most people say, well, this is the one where I make a payment on my debt. And here's how chapter 13 works. Let's say that you lost your job. Going back to the number one reason why you're looking at filing a bankruptcy. You lost your job and you were unemployed. It was a good job, great job, but you were unemployed for a year while you looked for work. And during that time, you got unemployment for a while, and that was all well and good, but it didn't pay the mortgage, the groceries, and everything else for your whole family. And as a result, you fell behind on your mortgage. Uh, and then you got a new job, and a good job. Wonderful. It's a good problem to have, trust me. Not, not, no bankruptcy attorney is ever going to tell you, don't, don't take that job <laughs> until this is done. Take the job. Um, you got a good job, and you can afford to pay your mortgage again but you're also six months behind and you can't afford to pay six months of mortgage in one lump sum to make yourself current. In a chapter 13 bankruptcy, you look at the equity in your property and determine if there was a seven, an asset seven where things were sold, how much money might creditors get? And then you take that plus the arrearage on your house or whatever you're behind on and that's what you pay over three to five years, divided into a monthly payment. Sometimes the percentage rate is as low as a penny on the dollar. So let's say you have $50,000 in credit card debt and you are behind um, four months on your mortgage. You take that 50,000, you turn that into 1%, you take that mortgage payment that you're behind, let's say 20,000, and then you divide that over payments over three to five years. Most people do five years under the law. But what that allows you to do is spread out the pain, spread out the hurt, and save what's important to you in a 13. The other reason to do a 13 is if you make too much money to qualify for a seven, but something weird is going on. Um, all bankruptcies are what's called means tested, meaning one of the things that your attorney will be asking about is what you make, where things come from, how much money's coming in, do you have any other source of income, is there child support, all of those things to be factored together to determine which chapter you qualify for. Big miss. I've touched on this one already. I will lose my house. I'll lose my car. Everything's going to fall apart. No. Losing property in bankruptcy is rare. You lose assets only in situations where it's unprotected for some reason um, or, or of a unique value. You're, a, a lot of people are concerned about their engagement rings. Um, for the most part, you're not going to lose your engagement ring uh, unless it's really big. <laughs> really, really big. This is what I tell people, and this is the, the simple version of how to think about it. Um, your attorney is going to go over the math and the numbers and the value and all of that with you. But my mother-in-law has been in the jewelry business, my, my in-laws have been in the jewelry business for a little over 100 years in Cincinnati and beyond that um, in the old country. <laughs> um, unless your engagement ring is something that will make her pause and go, ooh, what's that? you're going to be okay. They're not going to take your TV. They're not going to take your car. You know, your, your, the, the family vehicle is not going to go away. Um, and myth number two, filing bankruptcy is shameful. We touched on this as well. No, they exist to protect you and allow you to have a fresh start for the good of the individual and the society as a whole. So don't, don't let yourself be hung up on that and dig yourself into a deeper hole. One of the biggest challenges I think I face in my practice when I'm working with people who are filing for bankruptcy is they waited too long. If you're not sure, make an appointment. 
What's the, the worst thing is that after a half hour of talking to a lawyer, you leave. And, and you don't do anything. So, but when you, when you dig yourself into holes, that's when things get, get worse. All right, I have a process. And it is not what everybody else does, but it will be similar with, with whoever you're talking to. Um, I call it a four-step process with detours, okay? Step number one is the consultation. And this is, this is my form that I use just to keep track of notes and, and all that kind of stuff. You meet with a lawyer, you discuss the situation, you make a plan. Um, it's a surprisingly easy discussion, I promise you. Here's how mine goes. Hi, thank you, come in, have a seat. Do you need a glass of water? Would you like a coffee? Let's talk about this. Let me get your name. Let me get your address, phone number to reach you at, your email. Um, I'll, I'll likely ask you, hey, how'd you find me? Just, just so I know that my outreach to people is, is reaching people. Are you married, single, divorced, separated? These things matter. Um, do you own that real estate that you're living in? That makes a difference as to where things are going to go. Do you have one mortgage? Do you have a second mortgage or an equity load and something like that? Are you current on your mortgage? Um, how many cars do you own? Are they titled to you? Are you still paying a note? Do you have any other vehicles? I, I say it's the float flies or rolls syndrome. You know, do you have a boat, a motorcycle, a camper, a trailer? You know, all of these things are things that we want to make sure that you get to maintain within your life if possible. Um, income, federal law requires, and, this, and, and at this initial appearance, I'm just asking you to get an idea of what's going on. Income. Um, Federal law requires six months of pay stubs, ultimately. At, 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 and, and looking back six months prior to the date of the filing of the bankruptcy, to calculate that means test that I mentioned before, and to figure out where, where, what you qualify for and what, you sh what should be done. That number fluctuates based on certain IRS standards, and it depends on your family of one. You're a family of two, you're a family of five. That number is different, but it gives us an idea of, of figuring out what, as we sit here right now, are we looking at? Are we looking at a seven? Are we looking at a chapter 13? Insurance, this is, this is one of the holes people dig themselves into. I want everyone to keep their car insurance, not just because you are legally obligated to have it, but because God forbid you get in an accident and you don't have it, your debt has just ballooned. It's gotten worse, it's gotten bigger. And, ooh, even worse, let's say you do the bankruptcy, you don't have automobile insurance, and as you're driving home from your bankruptcy hearing, feeling so good about how you've cleared everything, you get in a crash, and you don't have insurance, you're right back where you started, and there's nothing that can be done about it. Um, health insurance, the same. You're, you, if you can keep it, do so because it, pr it, it protects you in the long run from bigger and more significant issues with debt. I ask you about prior filings. Have you ever filed for bankruptcy before? Because that limits certain things. You can't file a Chapter 7 again until eight years has passed since the last time it was filed. So that could make a decision as to whether or not you're in Chapter 7 or Chapter 13. It could make a decision as to whether or not bankruptcy is something you really want and need to do. Or is it an issue of figuring out a different path? All of these things go from there. And then, I, of course, I ask you about your debt. Credit cards, student loans, taxes, check cashing places, medical bills, anybody you owe money to, you know, we want to get an idea of that. A couple of notes on debt, student loans. They don't go away. Um, not unless you are functionally, permanently, totally disabled. And I'd rather have a student loan than, than a permanent total disability. And even then, it's a challenge to get rid of student loans. Taxes, for the most part, don't go away, although there are different ways of dealing with them. And when you talk with a lawyer, you want to talk with them and be honest about them and make sure that all the taxes you need to are filed and all of that kind of stuff. Um, oftentimes, though, when, if you can get out from under, if you do have a tax debt or a student loan debt that's really hurting you, if you get out from under your monthly payments on your credit cards, or if you've fallen behind due to check cashing, or if you have a massive medical bill that is crushing down on you, that, that relief of that pressure allows you to deal with those better. Also, while the bankruptcy stay is in effect, they're not calling, they're not pressing, they're not, you're not making payments. Under the law, we are required to quote you a price. 
what is a bankruptcy going to cost you? Um, for the most part, and again, I can't speak for everyone, but for the most part, and definitely for me, all bankruptcies are flat fee. That's why this, um, this first meeting is important, because I'm going to tell you what it's going to cost, and I'm going to be figuring out in my head how much time I'm going to be spending with you, how much, time, how much work everything's going to be. Oh, there we go. <laughs> and all of that. We're still in consultation. We're still in consultation, part one here. Um, and but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what the uh, court costs are, meaning the filing fee. I'm gonna tell you what the overall fees were, and then what a retainer is in order to put me to to work for you. Now here's something quirky that you need to know ahead of time, and this is how I handle it. Remember, you are filing for bankruptcy, meaning if someone extends you a line of credit. Once it is filed, they cannot ask you for money, and then once it is done, the debt is discharged. That means that as your lawyer, <laughs> if I quote you, let's just make up a number, $1,000, and I file it before I'm paid, I'm discharging the debt to myself. So different lawyers handle everything in different ways, but my way of handling it, I stay, I think, what I think true to the law is that I have to get paid up front. That said, be aware that if you are going to go through with a bankruptcy, the f other first thing I'm going to tell you other than I need to be paid up front is stop paying your debt. You're throwing good money after bad. If you're going to do the bankruptcy, stop paying the credit cards that you've been desperately trying to keep up with because they're going to be dealt with here. And, and, and even, the, even when you're hesitant on that, you're like, oh, but I've got I to gotta, I gotta pay, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. That's, that's okay. Because even if you pay them and then we file a bankruptcy, if you pay them, that's called a, it's, 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 tra it's a transfer that shouldn't have taken place. The, <laughs> the bankruptcy court will claw it back from them anyway and then disperse it among everyone. So it's not, it, it's not something that, that needs to be done. Um, I then move on to the homework phase. I, I give you a quote and price, and I actually will give it to you in a contract. Mine looks like this. Um, it goes through, it explains that I'm just filing, it. you're filing a bankruptcy, we'll be doing a bankruptcy. I sign it that day. I don't require you to sign it. I want you to take it home. I want you to look at it, go over it. Um, and I send you home with homework. This looks moderately daunting. Um, and this is what I tell people. This is a cup of coffee, glass of wine, over the kitchen table, figure it out. Go through it. This is everything you know about you that I don't know about you and that would take us forever in a conversation but if we can go through a form it helps social security number divorced all that kind of stuff this is your homework now i noted that there was a, a a special note on divorce earlier and this is what it is if divorce is the reason for your bankruptcy you may want to file for bankruptcy with your spouse before the divorce is complete um, it is a discussion that you need to have with your spouse and with your divorce attorney and with your bankruptcy attorney. But what it boils down to is if you and your spouse have commingled debt or some of you are both on it, if you file before the divorce together, and this is totally normal, trustees understand this, judges understand this, you're getting rid of that debt uniformly so that it doesn't have to be fought over in the divorce. Now, again, conversation that has to be had with a divorce attorney too, because if, if it's a really ugly divorce, if it's a fight, it may not work out like that. But realize that the practical impact of a joint debt where you file by yourself with your ex-spouse means you're putting that debt on them entirely. And in divorce, that's going to become another fight. So it's something that needs to be worked out, and that's the side note on that. What kind of questions are in this questionnaire? Well, how long have you worked at your job? Where do you bank? Um, my, my personal favorite, are you holding a winning lottery ticket? Um, I, I've recently updated my questionnaire because apparently a lot of cases have come through and trustees started asking about whether or not you have a medical implant. And the reason behind that is apparently a lot of class actions involving medical implants are are ending, are coming to fruition, and people are getting paid. Therefore, that's an asset that you have. So yes, I really do want to know about everything you own, from the ratty couch in your living room, to your car, to your bedroom set, and all of that. Not because it's going to be taken away, but I've got to account for everything. And the court has to account for everything. So, so yeah, yeah, we go through the, the whole kit and caboodle of what you need to know in here. Um, 
one of the things I ask about with assets is, 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 is for you to value them for me. And that's not replacement value. That's, if I were to sell that ratty couch in the living room right now at a garage sale, what, what, what would it be worth? What would it be worth to you? To figure out, is there anything we need to protect? Do you have inheritance, an inheritance coming? Is there an insurance policy? Life insurance is an asset that's very important because the difference between whole and term life insurance can impact whether or not it's protected. Um, tax returns, they're an asset. That's money coming back to you. All of these things are things that you need to watch out for. And that's why we do the homework, have you go, fill out the form to the best of your ability, and then bring it back. <laughs> and we go over it together because we don't want to miss any details. And that's also where I'll say, here's what a chapter seven is, and here's what a chapter 13 is. Again, documents. Documents are probably the most important thing in a bankruptcy. Just in general, this, is a pretty typical chapter 13. Um, that includes the petition, but it's pay stubs, um, tax returns, um, titles to vehicles, all, all of these kind of things. I, I, could, I could put a list up, but, it, but you know, hopefully your, your lawyer should be going over it with you, but it's your deed to your home, your mortgage, federal tax returns for at least two, uh, three years, excuse me, titles to all vehicles, um, proof of income for six months, your, your, your retirement plan. Now here's something people are really worried about is their retirement plan. Oh my gosh, I've had an IRA for 20 years. Is that, what's gonna happen to that? True ERISA retirement plans are protected from creditors. They can't touch them. Um, a certificate of participation in credit counseling. In order to file a bankruptcy, you have to have a certificate of counseling. It's done online. It's not that hard. Again, it's a kitchen table with the computer. Figure it out. And, and go through the, the process, get the certificate so that we can file. Uh, life insurance policies, we talked about that. Three months worth of bank statements because I don't want to be caught off foot should a, should a trustee say, well, did, did you buy a TV two months ago? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, and, and of course, you need to be able to prove who you are, your, your driver's license and social security card. And, and it is indeed a social security card, something you, you need that. So if you're short of Social Security card, you need to get yourself to the Social Security Administration to take care of that. Uh, divorce decree, if that applies, if there's a family trust, basically anything out there. And, and your lawyer will talk with you about that. But that's why you go through this. Here's a great example of why you go through this. I had a woman who forgot she owned a house. And it, and it took us some discussion. I know, I know, it's crazy, right? <laughs> um, it was mom's house. And years before, she and her siblings had taken over ownership of mom's house in four parts and it was never thought of as their house despite the fact that legally it was their house. So you go through it. We, we ask all these questions. My policy, and I believe it's the policy of most bankruptcy attorneys out there, is we work you to death ahead of time so that when you actually go to part, part four, there's a 341 meeting, it's a piece of cake. There are no surprises. We don't want surprises there. You don't want surprises there. We want you to go through it. Okay, so you've done homework. You've brought me documents. I send you on your way. I then draft the bankruptcy petition, which this one's had all identifying things removed from it. Looks like this. It's usually about 50 pages. It includes your budget, the means test that I discussed before, all kinds of questions. If it's a chapter 13, it includes the plan as proposed to the court, all of those things ahead of time. And you put that together and I have you come back in. Meeting number three. Again, we're working you because we don't want anything to go wrong. We don't want to miss anything. And this is where it gets really serious. We want you to look at this document as if you're already under oath and sign it as you're under oath. You are affirming, you are attesting that th this document is accurate. It has a list of your stuff. Even that ratty old couch in the living room is accounted for and it should be accounted for. And if there's something missing, you need to tell the lawyer because I don't want you signing it until we know what we need in it. Um, it, it builds your budget out. It shows how, if you have a Chapter 13 payment, how you're gonna make it. It shows how the house is being treated. It shows how the cars are being treated, all of these things. And that moves through it. And then you sign it. And at that point, here's where it gets exciting. It can be, it's ready to be filed. You file it with the bankruptcy court and the automatic stay at this point goes into place. Congratulations. 
Nobody can bug you about your debt anymore. You are, you've probably heard this on the news when General Motors filed for it or any other big company has filed for bankruptcy. Under the protection of the bankruptcy court, the stay is in effect. That federal court order that says leave this person alone is in play. And about four to six weeks, you're gonna lose a night of sleep because chances are you've never testified under oath and you're about to in front of a bankruptcy trustee. Uh, again, the bankruptcy trustee is that person who stands in for creditors, acts as a representative of the government to make sure everything's on the up and up. And if your lawyer's done their job, you will have heard every question or some form of every question that person's going to ask you. Um, I tell this to everyone and I, I offer this for what it's worth. Most questions are yes or no. Say yes or no and stop talking. <laughs> Um, you will be tempted to fill in the silence. Do not. <laughs> um, if they ask you a question that isn't yes or no, answer them truthfully, honestly, briefly, and stop talking. <laughs> um, your attorney will be there with you. Your attorney will be passing back and forth various documents to the trustee to try and facilitate things moving quickly. Uh, for example, your mortgage. We want to make sure you've got a valid mortgage. Your attorney's already figured out you've got a valid mortgage. The trustee hasn't. They hand it to them. Let that person look through it, go over it. Double check your signature, they'll hold it up. Is that your signature? Um, your retirement account that you were so worried about. Hand them a, a, a statement. It'll say 401k, that's a qualified ERISA account. Literally, if you've got everything ahead of time and in front of you, you can hand them that, that document that says 401k, and they'll, they'll say retirement plan, document, hmm, and then pass it back. That's what you want. You want it to go smoothly and quickly. Um, if it is a chapter seven, that's usually it for you. The magic words you want to hear is, this is a no asset case. That means you're done. It means they're gonna make a recommendation to the judge and for all intents and purposes, things are complete except for making sure you have filed your second online class and completed that and just waiting for the judge to get it done. If it is a chapter 13, you've already made one payment. You've made, you've made one payment already and you're moving forward um, with continuing payments and and you want the trustee to say this looks good we're going to recommend for confirmation I'm um, gonna be honest with you most of the times in 13s eh, there's a little bit of re moving things and moving things around and double checking things and and that but ultimately it goes to confirmation and you keep making your payments once the plan is confirmed that plan that payment plan becomes a court order and so long as you carry through with that you're okay. Um, you get through the plan and, and you then get the discharge at that point. Oh, talked about this. Let's review. Consultation. Um, it's getting to know you. Broad information collect. You're given a fee agreement. That's the law. You're given a fee agreement. Another thing that you may have seen on signs, some, some bankruptcy attorneys will advertise on billboards and that kind of thing. Sorry. <laughs> Um, we are a debt relief agency. You may see that. That is because in 2005, Congress passed what's called the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act. If your attorney says BAPSIPA in front of you, that's what they're referring to. Um, and that act required lawyers to be mixed in with anyone who does um, any kind of debt relief work. Um, and, and for whatever reason, we have to identify ourselves as a debt relief agency. So I consider myself a debt relief agency because I'm helping you get rid of debt. And for whatever reason, we're required to tell you that. Um, homework, complete your worksheet, gather your documents, review everything with your attorney. We've drafted it, it's ready to go. You've signed it, verified its accuracy, everything's in there, you file it. You go to your day in court, court in front of the trustee because you're not in front of a judge. And it's not a courtroom, it's a conference room. Um, you're put under oath, and we go over everything in the petition to make sure it's on the up and up. If you have chapter 13, again, it's confirmation. Make sure everything's acceptable to the court. And then, <laughs> hallelujah, you're done. A chapter seven can actually move very quickly. You can be done in a matter of months from beginning to end, from first consultation to last. Chapter 13, obviously, Usually you're in it for five years, but the work oftentimes can be done in just a couple of months from beginning to end. And that is bankruptcy. 
at least the basics of it. I think the most important thing to remember if you're considering it is talk to the lawyer, make sure you're following their advice and make sure that they explain all of these things to you because I've literally just taken you through three meetings plus your court appearance in this brief amount of time. The key to bankruptcy as I see it, and this is how I learned it, and I'm afraid I keep tapping the microphone, so I'm sorry if you all are hearing noises. The key to bankruptcy as I see it is to be overly prepared ahead of time to make sure you've anticipated everything that you can, that if any problems that may arise are dealt with ahead of time, and that are, any risks are understood fully and completely, and that means your attorney needs to be someone you can talk to and ask questions of, so make sure you've got that. And thank you for your time.